My name's Julian. Um, I run Natural Motions Racing Business based about half a mile down the road in Covent Garden. Um, and I've been making games now for 22 odd years, uh, which makes me old. Um, my first one was, oh God, way back in the, uh, in the, in the late 90s, a PC action strategy title. Uh, then went on and worked on more console product, uh, PlayStation 2 exclusive first person shooter called Cold Winter, which led to our studio being acquired in 2005. Um, and then actually, uh, mostly sequels, games such as 50 Cent Blood on the Sand, Operation Flashpoint Dragon Rising, GoldenEye 007, all console product, um, uh, before joining Natural Motion in early 14, after three years running Codemasters Racing Studio in Southern to build out our racing business. Um, over the last four years, I've led the development, built out the team, and then uh, ultimately led the live operation of CSR Racing 2, and it, it's done all right for us. Uh, CSR 2 is still the number one racing game on mobile uh, with over 50 million installs to date and we've got just the most wonderful partnerships across the industry. Um, we pride ourselves on being authentic um, and the place that people who want to collect cars go to for their, for their, for their hobby really, their passion of collecting cars. Uh, we've done a number of manufacturer co-launches. We launched the Lamborghini Urus with Lamborghini at the Geneva Motor Show this year and last year we partnered with McLaren to launch a 720S. Um, so we give our players what they want, uh, loads of cars to collect. And for the past two years, uh, we've added about 70 cars to the game every year. And we update about every six weeks, and that's a full, uh, full feature update into the community. Um, and so, you know, from experience, I guess, uh, what, we'll, what we'll talk about now over the next 20 minutes um, is the challenges that going, um, uh, that going to that next game, uh, creating that sequel, presents to the developers, uh, the team, the producers and the studio leadership, and they're, they're pretty unique challenges. Um, the first one is team engagement. Uh, how do you keep your teams engaged when they've been working on the same property for four, five, six, seven, eight years? In the case of live operations, many people have been involved in CSR2 for that, or CSR and then CSR2 for that long. And how do you get yourself and the team behind a property that in some cases people may not love, um, it may not be their, their, their blood and soul, and that was certainly true back in the console days. How do you meet consumer expectations um, that the next iteration, the next release, will in innovate and improve on what they've had before? Um, how do you resist the pressure to reinvent the wheel, um, particularly when people have got uh, franchise fatigue, recognising what's successful and beautiful about what you do uh, and should be carried over from release to release, uh, from version to version, from sequel to sequel? Um, and how do you stay relevant in a competitive market I mean, CSR Racing 1, when it came out, and I didn't work on that game, so I can say this as an outsider, um, it created a market for drag racing on mobile. Um, it was like a bolt out of the blue, right? I mean, it, it created an amazingly vibrant market space. Um, and it, then it got copied a lot. So how do you stay relevant in that marketplace? How do you create something that's really, uh, really interesting to the consumer and actually interesting as a business? Um, we'll look at the mindset uh, that's required to win and I think probably the seven key learnings I've had over the past 22 years that I think are applicable to sequels and, and licensed product but equally to any original product and the first one is, is team engagement uh, we don't all have the luxury of working on all of the games uh, that we work on to choose our, our way through our career you know you end up working on stuff through luck, fortune, uh, good or bad timing um, that wouldn't necessarily be something you would move to uh, 50 Cent Blood on the Sand, which I'll, I'll talk about now a little bit, was a game that definitely chose its maker. Uh, this is going back to the, to the early 2000s. Myself and the dev team in Birmingham in the UK were working on this really serious investigative first-person shooter uh, based on a licensed universe. And after nine months, we had a killer, uh, literally and metaphorically, a killer vertical slice. It was amazing. I would say that, but it was actually amazing. Uh, we took it over to, to Los Angeles to demo to the parent company. And they were like, we love it. This is, um, this is just brilliant. It's got puzzle solving. It's got investigation. It looks beautiful. But we're losing confidence in the, in the license that you're, you're making this for uh, because the other, uh, the other expressions of this license on TV and film aren't performing as well as we would like. So how about this? And here came the elevator pitch. Take it, make it third person and add 50 cents. And we've got a story for you. He goes to a war-torn country, his pay dirt gets stolen, and him and G-Unit get given a diamond-encrusted skull as collateral. That gets stolen, and you subsequently move across this war-torn country, uh, killing people to recover the diamond-encrusted skull and to get your money back. <coughs> it was a strong idea, um, and I wasn't quite sure how we were going to present this to the development team. I mean, it was, it was definitely bold. 
Um, the other problem we had is this was a sequel, right? This was a sequel to uh, the original 50 Cent game, which had been really cruelly, and it is very cruel, called 50 Per Cent, because the review scores just weren't there. So we had a very commercially successful original game, quite a strong uh, creative direction from our parent company, um, and a team who are used to working on original properties. And so I guess the question we were asking was, how do you bring all this together? Um, how do you, you know, really create something that's authentic and sincere? Um, oops, sorry, excuse me. Somehow I've... Create something that's authentic and sincere. And the key thing is, everybody lent into it and got behind it. Um, the key thing that we did is the design team recognised the absurdity of this concept. They knew we had to lean into this absurdity to find the title's creative strength. And rather than a serious shooter, we introduced a point scoring and combo system, um, driving the mayhem of profanity, as you can see here. Uh, the audio director wanted to really take that to the next level. So when you performed a, a final combo, you pressed down the thumbstick of the, of the joypad to gain extra points as 50 swore as you took people out. We were playful with the scripts, the narrative, the level design, and the gameplay mechanics. And the writing team, whilst taking 50 Cent and G Unit, who are really serious business people, it's got, it's got to be said, and very serious brand ambassadors, we took them very seriously, but we allowed the characters of 50 Cent and G Unit in the game to be acutely self-aware of, uh, of their part in this out-there mission. The voice team did a brilliant job. They cast uh, Howling Mad Murdoch from the A-Team, Dwight Schultz as the main bad guy, um, and Q Mayhem across, across this war-torn country, taking out French and English mercenaries who are working for them. The art and level design team told a story of failed adventurism as 50 Cent takes him from the ghetto to the mall, to the freeway, to the cinema, and finally to the hilltop crib. And as the original gangster rap artists like Dre, M&M, um, uh, and 50 obviously lent into what they knew to create uh, really amazing art, uh, that created an emotional reaction in their audience. So we did the same thing, bringing together that attitude without their game design. Um, it was described in the same sentence by Giant Bomb as the best game, no, actually the worst game you've ever played, at somewhere in the middle. Uh, Charlie Booker described it as everything that was wrong with video games at the time. Uh, and it's subsequently gone on to develop, uh, to, to get firstly some great reviews and also a bit of a fan following. Um, it massively divided the audience. And we kind of did that by, by, by design. Uh, this is a Penny Arcade, one or two Penny Arcade cartoons. They loved it, uh, as, as did quite a lot of reviewers who recognised there was something very different about this title, that behind the presentation were a lot of sound decisions, a very efficient development, um, I mean, run by a really brilliant, brilliant production team, actually, uh, and a great uh, and sincere intent to make a great game, a great 50-cent game, regardless of any of the other constraints. Uh, close to launch, we were... Uh, and if you, Does anyone know Birmingham in the West Midlands? Oh, my God. Right, so Birmingham is like, it's quite provincial. And back in the day, it was even more so. And we were like, we were a bunch of geeks, like making video games because we loved them. And so we're there in the office and, you know, the publishing organisation sent across a really cool rap, a rap YouTube crew to our office to interview these guys who'd made a 50 cent game. And they walked in and looked horrified as they're presented with these geeks, like making video games. They thought they were going to face someone really cool. And I think it speaks to the the authenticity and the sincerity with which we approached the game, um, that actually didn't come across in the content. It was a really authentic and sincere interpretation of what a 50 cent game could be. Um, and that brings us to kind of take out number one, really, that regardless of what you're working on, you have to love the process of making game, but I know you all do. Um, but I think that's one of the things that came to me later. You can love games, fine, but that's not gonna get you through this industry. You've gotta love the process, love innovating within the process, regardless of what you're working on. Um, the second thing is, is player expectation. I mean, 50 Cent, people did not expect it to be a good game. And that's one of the reasons why it got such a cult following. I mean, it still gets referenced today uh, whenever I talk about um, the games we've worked on. People are like, oh, I loved that game. It was amazing. Um, people's expectation was really low, and we over-delivered significantly. Uh, and with sequels, everyone has an opinion, right? The consumers, the business, the team who've worked on it before, the team are working on it now. And we see this dynamic play out every day in every medium, regardless of, uh, of whether it's film, TV, or whatever else, with creative teams switching approach, approaches to create interest in the sequel. Um, when I joined Activision, um, they'd got to vertical slice on the sequel to, to GoldenEye 007. Uh, Eon Pictures, Nintendo, Activision, and Eurocom had partnered to create a sequel to one of the most loved games of all time, GoldenEye 2007. And given the legendary status, everything was being thrown at this title. Um, it was a Wii exclusive. Uh, the developers of Eurocom put a real best-in-breed team against it. Um, and Activision backed it like nothing else. Um, 
really nothing was compromised. It doesn't come through in this, in this slightly blur blurry image, unfortunately, uh, to bring physics, uh, amazing visual effects, uh, an incredible post effects chain, brilliant level design, contemporary weaponry, and the cast of the Daniel Craig era Bond films to the game. The aim was to deliver something that nodded to the original, right? It was authentic, but it wasn't designed to remake the original. It was a complementary title designed to coexist alongside that original game. You can see here in the dam level, if you played the N64 game, um, this is actually a very iconic scene from the dam level, but all the levels were reimagined uh, using contemporary design aesthetic because we knew it could never replace the original game, right? I mean, it was impossible to remake GoldenEye. So what we did is we reimagined what GoldenEye might look like now with Daniel Craig, a contemporary shooter best practice and design for the Wii hardware. It did really well. It did really, really well. It's an approach uh, and a philosophy that we took uh, very much into our fast fate of furious integration in CSR2. We ran a whole year of events last year, and we're still running them now, actually, of fate and furious and fast and furious events. And when we did that, we knew it had to be more than the cars. You know, that would have been easy to have thrown the cars in. But we were adamant we wanted the characters, uh, Hobbs, Letty, Tedge, to present their cars, to be part of the narrative of the game, to be invited into our world. Um, it caused us you know, some definite uh, complexities as we got, as we got the, the events to market, because we wanted them to be day and date with the film launches. Um, but it was a really sincere drive for authenticity that made us take that challenge on. Um, and I think it shows that some of our best performing events to date, we're still running them now, running uh, classic uh, events using the, the, the uh, classic cars from the franchise, um, all delivered authentically to AAA standards. And so I think at the heart of this is the second thing that I think is, again, something I just hold dear to every project I work on. You've got to be creatively sincere. Uh, players grew tired of cynicism a very, very long time ago. And in our business, the, the you know, casual mid-core free-to-play business, there's a lot of copying going on, we know that. Um, but I think if you approach all of your endeavours with creative sincerity, it carries a long way. Players can smell insincerity. Um, and I think if you want committed, long-term relationships with a really meaningful fan base, uh, you've got to be sincere in the way you approach your creative and your content. And that's something we do. We do a natural motion all the time. Um, in 2009, Codemasters released this game, Operation Flashpoint Dragon Rising. Um, it was, I had an amazing sincerity, actually, it was incredible. It was designed to update a game by Bohemia Interactive, which was a big open war war simulation, uh, totally uncompromising, and players were expecting something big and ambitious. Um, they took that responsibility seriously. They put their biggest team behind it, Codemasters, uh, their longest dev and their biggest investment. It was huge. It was an entirely unscripted war simulation. I mean, crazy ambitious, right? Uh, in which the theatre of battle would never play out the same, the same way twice, with units and platoons all aiming to fill their individual objectives. It was an absolute nightmare to debug. I mean, it was a nightmare. Um, in 2009, the game that made it to market just had too many defects. It was so hard to debug, and it was unbalanced. And actually, to the consumer, if you worked through those challenges, it was a spectacular, ambitious, bold, uh, bold game for the time, for sure. But the reality is the quality of execution didn't match the ambition in many cases. And if you met those balancing challenges, if you got stuck, went off the path, you know, inverted commas in an open world game, um, it got very difficult very quickly. And so I think from that, um, it remains kind of a, a, a sad moment for me, really, to think about that game because it could have been so spectacular um, had there been the final commitment to quality. It was up against a very hard deadline, so no criticism to anyone who works on the project. Uh, they really did have to come out on the, on the dates. Uh, but ultimately, that game launched sooner than it was ready. It had too many defects, um, and it wasn't balanced properly. Um, and so we're all faced with those compromises, right? But it comes at a big cost. Um, I think these days, with our releases and with our, with our launches, we commit to quality. And we have the advantage, obviously, in the free-to-play business that we can continue to update them on a regular basis to get the game right. And we have soft launches and A-B testing that enables us to continually refine our offering to our players. Um, so Natural Motion some time ago created this. Uh, this is our player charter. Um, and we hold it very, very, very dear to what we do. Um, it's at the blood of the, of, of the studio. Uh, we give our players high quality stable point releases every time. We just talked about quality. We respect our players as partners and our spenders as patrons. Um, and we do. We respect all of them. They all form part of our ecosystem, our economy. We collaborate and communicate with our player base. Um, we weren't brilliant at this in the first year, and we've got much better at it recently. We tell them what's coming. We educate and inform in advance of them finding a feature, and then we respectfully support and adapt after. Regardless of whether they're a payer or a non-payer, uh, we provide value and recognition to all levels of players with no buyer's remorse. 
And critically, we remember that they are players, um, not data. And so this brings us to the next one, is that uh, learning number four, I mean, for all of us, right, is I love data. We use it to inform business decisions. We use it to learn about how engaged our team are um, through platforms like Tiny Pulse. We're regularly measuring team engagement, belief in our vision and our mission. Um, it informs everything that we do. We obviously love uh, all of our data stack. It's, it's quite astonishing the scale of the enterprise we've got between uh, Zynga in San Francisco and, and Natural Motion in London. But we love our players more than that. Um, behind all of the data, behind every cohort, behind every um, uh, player archetype that we can assess and analyse lie people who have needs and servicing those needs is the most important thing we can do. Uh, competition is fierce as we know uh, within our sector competition is fierce. Uh, I talked earlier success breeds imitation right um, and if enough people are trying it can create a really noisy environment for you from a player acquisition perspective but just also from a business perspective um, it's a really competitive market when it comes to talent. Um, you know, and I think talent is, is the heart and soul of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, really. Um, in this climate, and I think from this point and forever, uh, forever, forevermore, um, our biggest competitive advantage as a studio is our talent and their capability for independent thought and decision-making. Um, I've said it many times before, but this beautiful group of people um, who come from every continent on planet Earth, apart from Antarctica, but we did sponsor a penguin. Um, so technically, we have someone from every continent on planet Earth. Um, they are amazing, and they bring their, their passion, they bring their commitment, they bring their independent thinking to the studio every single day. They give more to this project and to our fan base than, than I can possibly say. Um, and I think what they find, I hope what they find, because this is what we're going to, to set out, is a studio environment in which they're paid attention to, they're listened to without interruption. They're treated as equal thinking partners, regardless of seniority. They have an easeful workspace and a work environment, so they can do their very best thinking. They're appreciated for the qualities that they bring uh, on the good days and on the bad days, and they're encouraged to go to the very cutting edge of ideas and not stop at great, um, to go further than that, to truly exceptional. We recognize that how they feel impacts how they think and therefore recognising that and working with feelings is actually a really important part of our studio culture um, and actually delivers value to the consumer um, you know, in very short order. We supply all the information. We're a database business, but I've said this. Uh, there's uh, total transparency between the team and leadership. There's no obfuscation of information, whether it's revenue, uh, retention, uh, whatever, else, um, whatever else we're looking at. Uh, we have a very diverse team, um, uh, gender diverse, uh, ethnically diverse, country diverse but also diverse thinkers. And cognitive diversity is actually the stuff that challenges you to think differently. Um, we like to think we ask great questions um, and give them a place where all of that comes together and they're showing their recognition. And for those of you who are going to be at our party tomorrow night, um, hopefully you'll see some of that. Um, and I think this is really important because the talent of the quality that we're looking for is really scarce. Uh, people who can, and this is from the World Economic Forum, um, the skill change between 2015 and 2020. Uh, but the reality is we're looking for the same things, right? Look at the top six. Complex problem solvers, critical thinkers, creatives who are good at people management and coordinating with others and have high emotional intelligence. If that doesn't sound like your hit list uh, for your development team, I don't know what does. Uh, good quality judgment and decision making, service orientation. I mean, it's the free to play business all over. Um, so we're all looking for the same people regardless of industry. Uh, people who've got high self-perception can express themselves. Great teamwork and interpersonal relationships understand how to make decisions in the absence of authority and hierarchy and can cope with stress because ultimately what we do has pressure and it's easy for pressure to turn into stress. Um, one of the things, and we're sort of coming towards the close now, you, you'll, you'll like to know um, that I've learned is, you know, time is like, it's infinite really. You know, there's more time than any of us can spend in our lifetime. Uh, but energy's not. Energy, when it goes, it's really bad individual energy, uh, give me a super talented developer who's got no energy left and they can't do anything, you know, they need to recharge. Give me a team who've been a high performer but are just drained of their life, they're not going to do anything. Uh, managing individual and collective energy is so much more important than crunching and overtime and clock watching at the end of the day. And our teams work hard and they're committed through the evenings and weekends when they need to be. But the most important thing to us is to watch energy and manage that. 
and look at what creates that team culture, quality leadership from all of the people in our studio, good quality hiring, the systems and processes that work hand in hand with what's happening to that side of work, their connections with friends and other people and social groups, um, the time they spend in green spaces, uh, their connection to sport and exercise and all the other things that draw energy into ourselves and allow us to refresh ourselves as creatives and developers. Um, because at the end of the day, I really believe this to be true, not product, not data, nothing matters more than the team. Give me a great team who are full of energy and they will do wonderful things every single time. Um, if I was to define my purpose these days, it's building engaged commercial teams um, that deliver business value. I, I love working with people and I love seeing my team flourish, they're spectacular. Um, and they have a purpose. Um, and this is the something we hold very, 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 very dear. Uh, our aim is to make people's lives a little bit better, actually, um, to enable people who love racing and our, our passion for cars to create social connections and friendships. And we see this. They are gathering strength from each other. They are supporting each other. Um, I haven't got time to talk about some of the outreach work we've done, uh, but there are people who are meeting people who are helping them through what we do, which is uh, connecting people, creating friendships through a shared passion for cars every day. Um, as I said, my purpose in all of this is to allow that thinking to flourish in our team, um, to hopefully create a creative, innovative, innovative culture in really curious, passionate people who want to do amazing work. And I guess that's one of my purposes. That's my final thing I learned really quite recently is what, you know, what are our purposes? Because if you find that, you connect to people and you connect to your gamers in such an authentic way that everything else we've talked about uh, becomes easy. It's easy to love the process and be sincere and commit to quality. And yes, to love data, but definitely to love your players more than that. To manage your energy and the team's energy and their individual energy rather than their time. Um, and to create great teams who have purpose in the world and do something spectacular. Um, we are natural motion. Uh, we're also looking for great people. Um, if you want to talk to us about that, please do. We're downstairs. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. Uh, you looked attentive or asleep. I can't work out which one it was. Do you have any internal system of the feedback from the uh, team developers uh, that they should go through to get you some ideas, or is just some meetings you have and share the ideas, or how it's, is it working? So, so, so it's both, actually. So we, we, the, the question is, oh, do we have internal systems to do it? We actually use um, a commercially available platform called Tiny Pulse. And Tiny Pulse is a web-based platform that asks a, a Pulse question each week, and then every four weeks asks, are you happy at work? So it's just a baselining question every four weeks to see if they're happy. But then in the other three weeks, it'll ask questions about engagement, quality of leadership, which is always terrifying. Um, are your management transparent? Are you learning from your management? Are they sharing with you? Do you feel you're doing your best work? What's holding you back? And people can rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 and then give direct feedback. It takes two minutes, right? It's a super quick survey. But over time, it builds a really good picture, both of how people are feeling, but based on the response level, how many people are engaging and how many people are disengaging over time. It's been wonderful. I mean, it's a really great way for us to remain connected. But then all the other systems you know about, one-to-ones, um, you know, team meetings and such like. Isn't getting just routine to answer these questions? Like, I, ha I need to, five minutes, okay. Um, what we find is that because it's anonymous and people don't know if they're being watched or not, they can engage with it or not engage with it. Um, and we find that engagement levels change over time. Um, you know, I think you know, on good weeks it can be 70 to 80%, uh, on other weeks it's 60%. Mm -hmm. But we normally get that, that volume of the team engaging. Bear in mind they're not always in the office at the time. So no, it doesn't get uh, routine. But the one thing you have to do uh, as leaders within the business is make sure you're answering people's questions. Mm -hmm. And they will ask them. And if they're getting ignored, they'll disengage from the platform. So that, it does create a little bit of overhead. But it's so worth it. I mean, it's so worth it. Our uh, talent turnover levels are incredibly low. I mean, low single digits and have been for four years. And I think it's because we have that strong connection with the team that in central London you can have those really low single digit um, uh, you know, uh, churn levels. So I think it works well. Hi there. I was just wondering, uh, in the free-to-play market, obviously normally making sequels isn't the um, sort of standard it's more developing so is that something you guys had always planned to do to, to have a sequel model or did it just come about naturally that perhaps there was too many things you were looking to change and some updates and you thought and if so is that your plan going forward to sort of csr3 or is it more of a wait and see till if it feels right to do that again yeah it's, it's, it's a great question actually so with C I mean, I, I wasn't here um, when we made csr1 which is why i can kind of laud the work that was done and have done in the past actually um, 
it was out of necessity, I mean, for sure, um, but it was also out of design. Um, at the outset, when they launched CSR 1, I think the success of that title definitely, de definitely caught that promotion um, unawares. They knew it was good, but then they put it into soft launch and it just blew. I mean, it was incredible. Um, the reality was there were some uh, quite significant systemic uh, shortfalls in that game. Some of them design uh, shortfalls, some of them technology shortfalls. And the reality is CSR 2 could never have been a sequel to CSR 1. Uh, sorry, it could never have been an update to CSR 1. It had to be a new game, new engine, new platform. Um, not least of which it just wasn't designed for live operations. So the Boss Alien team did a phenomenal job of keeping it vibrant and alive. Uh, the reality is it couldn't be live operated in the way that we wanted. Um, and actually, if we go back, they did a really great job of keeping the graphics updated, but the quality of the visuals that we have in CSR2 required an entirely new engine, which is why we hired a new console team, rendering experts, graphics experts, because we wanted you know, pseudo-photo-realism um, or uh, super-authenticity, if you like, um, on a mobile platform. And that wouldn't have been possible in an incremental update. So it was by design. Uh, we haven't decided what we're doing in the future yet. Um, it's a very vibrant business for us at the moment uh, with many fans, so we'll continue to service those fans for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really cool. Thank you. Thank you very much.